Now let's have a look at some more examples from the social and domestic context. Now the general rule of course is that in this context the intention to create legal relations does not apply. There's a presumption against that. Now where parents and children are concerned there is no intention to create legal relations. The presumption holds true. And this is very well demonstrated by the case of Jones and Padavatsan. Miss Padavatsan was the daughter in this case and Mrs. Jones was the mother. Miss Padavatsan lived in Washington DC and worked at the Indian Embassy there. Her mother lived in Trinidad. Now the mother was very keen for her daughter to study law. So the mother made an offer to the daughter which was that if she gave up her position in Washington DC and moved to London to study law, the mother would provide her with an apartment and basically pay for her upkeep. The daughter accepted that offer and moved to London to take up legal studies. Now unfortunately after a few years the mother and the daughter fell out and the mother wanted to repossess the apartment that the daughter was living in and the daughter refused to do so saying that she was entitled to live there because there was a contract between mother and daughter to the effect that so long as the daughter was studying law the mother would provide this apartment and the court held that there was no such legally enforceable contract because there was no intention to create legal relations simply because mother and daughter when they have an agreement the presumption is that there is no such intention however and this is our next case our next example there may be an exception where the consequences are very serious now in Parker and Clark this case involved an uncle and an aunt on the one hand and a niece and her husband on the other hand the aunt and the uncle wanted to have the niece and her husband come and live with them they were getting older and frail and it was going to be useful for them to have the niece and her husband around now in order to entice them the uncle and the aunt promised to give them a share of the house the house that they would then all be living in now the niece and the husband accepted that offer and moved in with the uncle and the aunt. In order to do so, they had to take some fairly far-reaching steps. Namely, they had to move out of their own house, which they sold, and they basically gave up that part of their life in order to come and live with the uncle and the aunt. When they fell out and the uncle and the aunt did not want to provide that share of the house that they had promised, the court held that here there was an intention to create legal relations simply because the consequences for the niece and her husband were very serious. What they had to do in order to accept and carry out the uh, contract between themselves and the uncle and the aunt was very serious. After all, they had to give up their own home and move out of their own home. So here the presumption was rebutted. There's also an exception where a, a child in law is involved, which of course we already saw um, earlier in Errington and Errington Woods. So what happened in Hardwick and Johnson is that the um, son and a daughter-in-law are promised a, a house in return for rent. So a house is bought for them and then they have to pay rent on that house and eventually they would own the house. When the, um, there was a falling out and the um, son moved out and there was only the daughter-in-law left who kept paying the rent, she laid claim to this offer and acceptance to this contract and in fact it was held that there was intention to create legal relations but unlike in Arrington and Arrington Woods where the um, focus of the case was on the fact that there had been a unilateral offer the focus here was on the fact that the daughter-in-law was not a daughter but merely a daughter-in-law. We looked at various situations so far involving family now let's move on and look at friends. What happens in the social and domestic context where friends are concerned? Now the same presumption, the presumption against intention to create legal relations also applies to contracts involving friends. And a very good case to illustrate this is Coward and the Motor Insurance Bureau. Mr. Coward was a passenger on a motorcycle which was owned and driven by his friend. And in fact, Mr. Coward and his friend had had this arrangement for a long time whereby the um, friend would give Mr. Coward a lift, a ride to work on the motorcycle. And sometimes Mr. Coward would contribute to the price of petrol to fill up the, the motorcycle. Now, fortunately, there was an accident and Mr. Coward was hurt. Now, the insurance would only pay out 
to Mr. Coward if, in fact, there was a contract for carriage, a contract for hire, whereby Mr. Coward and his friend had been in a contractual relationship and the friend basically took Mr. Coward as a paying passenger. And in order to demonstrate that there was such a contract, Mr. Coward brought up this argument that, in fact, he had paid for the petrol or contributed to the petrol. However, the court held that there was no legally enforceable contract between the friend and Mr. Coward, simply because there was no intention to create legal relations. And the presumption, of course, was that there was no such intention, and that was held to be the case here. Another way of looking at it, to make sense of it, is what if Mr. Coward one day had not been picked up by his friend? Could he then have sued his friend for not picking him up? Because after all, he was arguing that they had a contractual relationship regarding the um, being given a lift to work. And probably he couldn't have done that. So it seems like this case was decided correctly. And so the in the end, the Motor Insurance Bureau did not have to pay because there was no contract between Mr. Coward and his friend. Very similarly, in Heslop and Burns, um, there were lodgers who lived with their friend in a house. Now, the friend had promised that they would take a share of the house, and unfortunately, the friend passed away. They sought to remain in the house according to their friend's promise. However, the court held that this was an arrangement amongst friends, hence there was no intention to create legal relations. The presumption applied. What about the exceptions? Well, one exception is where there is mutuality. Now, the case for this is Simpkins and Pays. What happens in Simpkins and Pays was that there were... Um, three people, uh, a grandmother, a granddaughter, and a lodger, who perhaps was a friend, but certainly was a lodger living together with the grandmother and the granddaughter. So, in fact, we probably have a situation of a combination of both family and friends. And these three parties participated in a competition uh, on a weekly basis to do with newspapers and newspaper cutouts. So every... Um, week the newspaper the Sunday paper would have a little portion that you would cut out and you would send in in order to, to participate in the competition and the likelihood of winning was of course not very big but the more often you did it the more likely it was that you were going to win so they took turns in terms of who would do the cutting out and who would do the sending off which of course involves effort because you have to cut out the bit of the newspaper, you have to send it off, you have to put on a stamp, you have to go to the post box, and so on and so forth. So they took turns doing that. Now, one week they actually won, but that week it happened to be the grandmother who would put down the name and who'd done the, the cutting out, and it was her name on the slip. And so she claimed the winnings, which were 750 pounds, which of course at the time was a lot of money. The question arose, whether the three had an agreement which was legally enforceable by which the grandmother would have had to have shared the winnings and the court held they did have an agreement so that means the intention to create legal relations did exist and there was no presumption against that because the presumption was rebutted on the basis of the fact that there was mutuality all three of them were part of this contract in equal shares they all chipped in in the same way and they should have all been able to profit in the same way as well. So that's the exception relating to mutuality. And then lastly, as we had with family, there's also the exception relating to business. In uh, Headley and Clark, which is a Barbadian case, there was a um, there were two friends and one of the friends was a realtor and the other friend was selling their house. And uh, once that was done, the uh, friend who had sold their house was not willing to pay the commission as agreed and argued that in fact theirs was an arrangement between friends. The court held that even though they were friends, the arrangement was purely of a business nature and hence there was intention to create legal relations and the arrangement, the agreement was legally enforceable. Let's now move on to the second type of contract we may come across. So first we looked at contracts which are of a domestic or a social nature and now we're going to look at contracts which are of a business or commercial nature. Now of course in the real world these contracts, business or commercial contracts, are far more prevalent. The presumption in this context, in the business or the commercial context, 
is that the parties did have an intention to create legal relations. So that is the presumption, the assumption that we make just because it is a business contract or a commercial contract. A leading case in this regard is Edwards and Skyways. What happened in Edwards and Skyways is that Skyways was the employer and Mr. Edwards was the employee. Mr. Edwards was let go. He was a pilot and he was let go uh, because of a case of redundancy. Now, Skyways offered Mr. Edwards something that they called an ex gratia payment. And ex gratia literally means out of thanks. Now, Skyways did not pay and Edwards sued them. The lawyers for Skyways argued that because ex gratia means out of thanks, it is discretionary. It is up to Skyways to decide whether or not they want to pay and they just decided not to pay. Edwards lawyers argued, on the other hand, that this was an agreement for the redundancy, so basically an agreement to end an employment relationship, and because that is an agreement of a business or commercial nature, specifically an employment-related agreement, there was an intention to create legal relations, and of course there was also consideration, and there was offer, and there was acceptance, and therefore the contract should be legally enforceable, and the court agreed. So. We know that where an agreement is of a business or a commercial nature, the intention to create legal relations is presumed to exist. Now, just as we did when we talked about domestic and social arrangements, we're going to look at a number of possible exceptions to the presumption. In other words, how can we rebut the presumption? Now, a very important case in this regard is Rosen Frank and J.R. Crompton. J.R. Crompton were the um, manufacturers, producers of carbon paper. So paper that you use in order to create copies of something that you write and it copies through onto the other paper, the other page which is behind the carbon paper. Now, Rosen Frank were the distributors of Crompton's paper in the United States. And in fact, they had an exclusive agreement whereby no one else was allowed to distribute Crompton's products in the United States. So that's a fairly lucrative deal. However, that deal, this exclusivity deal, was based on the clause that we see here um, at the bottom. And here's what the clause said. This arrangement is not entered into, nor is this memorandum written as a formal or legal agreement and shall not be subject to legal jurisdiction in the law courts, but it is only a definite expression and record of the purpose and intention of the three parties concerned to which they each honorably pledged themselves with the fullest confidence based upon past business with each other that it will be carried through by each of the three parties with mutual loyalty and friendly cooperation. So that was the exact clause used in the agreement. The court held that the words honorable or honorably pledge, those two words designate that the parties had in fact excluded, they had explicitly excluded the intention to create legal relations. It was merely an honorable pledge. Hence, Rosen Frank were not able to claim the exclusivity. That was basically a promise made by Crompton on the basis of an honorable pledge. And if and when Crompton decided not to honor their pledge anymore, that was basically their problem. It was not an issue for the courts to address. So it is possible even though we have this presumption for intention to create legal relations, it is possible to exclude the intention explicitly by way of these types of words such as honorable pledge. Let's look at some additional examples of where the intention to create legal relations can be rebutted. For instance, where the words gentleman's agreement are used, such as in Sosa and the Marketing Board, which is a Trinidadian case, there is no intention to create legal relations. So this is fairly similar to the previous case of Rose and Crompton, which of course involved the words honorable pledge. So here again, by using words that designate that you do not intend to be bound, you will not be bound. What happened in Sosa and the Marketing Board is that Sosa and the Marketing Board had a contract, which however contained those two words, gentleman's agreement, whereby the marketing board would sell Sosa bananas and then he would be um, selling them on in the United States. Now, when the relationship soured, Sosa sued the marketing board. 
However, it was held that their agreement was not a legally enforceable contract because of the lack of intention to create legal relations, perfectly shown by the two words gentleman's agreement. So what we learn from this is where we want to avoid the repercussions of having a um, contract of a binding agreement, which is based on the intention to create legal relations, what we do is we insert words such as gentleman's agreement or words to that effect. Another very general exception is where the agreement involves gambling, such as in Jones and Vernon Pools. The basic rule is that the courts will not enforce such agreements. So agreements that involve gambling are binding in honor only. Then there's also an exception where the agreement is subject to contract. In Masters and Cameron, that was a case involving the sale of property. The agreement that the parties have reached was subject to contract. In other words, the parties, even though they were nearly there, they weren't quite there because there was um, the, the contract still had to be finalized and the words subject to contract and the um, judgment here were meant to mean that there were still conditions um, to be fulfilled and so there was no contract until these conditions were in fact fulfilled. So again, no intention to create legal relations in the agreement that precedes the actual final contract. So a few more exceptions that we need to look at. Um, what about comfort letters? What is a comfort letter? What effect does it have? Well, as we found out in Kleinwood Benson and Malaysia Mining Corporation, a comfort letter is not a legally enforceable agreement. What is a comfort letter? Well, to best understand that, we need to briefly look at the facts of this case. So Kleinwood Benson, of course, is the bank, and the bank had given a loan to a subsidiary of the Malaysia Mining Corporation. Now, the Malaysia Mining Corporation had issued the bank with a comfort letter, and the comfort letter stated things to the effect that all its subsidiaries are well run and they're liquid and they have no problem paying and so on and so forth. So in other words, the letter is meant to comfort the bank in the knowledge that any loans given to this subsidiary will be repaid. And then of course the subsidiary did not repay and Clyde Benson brought this case. However, this written assurance, which was a comfort letter, was not one that led to the intention to create legal relations. It did not form part of a valid legal contract because it was merely a comfort letter. So this is a point which is somewhat related to a gentleman's agreement or an honorable pledge. It's slightly different here, obviously, because um, it's a comfort letter, which is not quite the same. And obviously, we also have three parties involved here where basically one party issues a comfort letter regarding another party but the exception applies nonetheless. And lastly, there's also an exception where there are advertisements concerned where there are mere puffs. Now, of course, in Carlyle and the Carbolic Smoke Bowl Company, we already talked about this case earlier, the exception did not apply because the Smoke Bowl Company had put down a deposit with the bank showing their intention. But normally, when there are mere puffs involved, mere advertisements, there is no intention to create legal relations. Um, Esso Petroleum and the Commissioners of Customs and Excise is a very instructive case in this regard. What happened in this case was that Esso Petroleum had a promotion whereby if you bought petrol, you would get some football coins, um, which were to do with the World Cup, which was taking place at the time. Now, whether or not there was a contract involving those football coins was important for tax reasons, because if there was a contract, then Esso um, was liable to pay taxes to the commissioners of customs and excise. The court held that there was no contract regarding the coins. The contract was about the petrol, not about the coins. And so there was no intention to create legal relations with customers regarding the disbursement of these football coins. And then this is fairly easy to understand because if you'd gone to the petrol station and filled up your car and asked for the coins, if they had said, well, we've run out, well, then they've run out and you cannot, as a customer, then claim that you want to have, you need to have those coins. So this makes a lot of sense. No intention to create legal relations as far as the uh, coins themselves were concerned. Of course, with the petrol, there, there, there is and there was a contract. 
Lastly, in Halbert Simons and uh, Buckleton, there was um, a manager in a company who advised that um, shares were being issued and these, uh, uh, the company uh, for whom the shares were being issued um, was going to open a rubber plantation. That information then turned out to be untrue or incorrect. The question arose whether the information given by the manager was a mere puff, no intention to create legal relations, or whether it was more than that. And the court held it was a mere puff, hence no intention to create legal relations surrounding that particular statement. So to summarize, we got social and domestic agreements, and we've got business and commercial agreements. As far as social and domestic agreements are concerned, the presumption is of no intention to create legal relations, and our anchor case, our leading case, is Balfour and Balfour. The presumption can be rebutted, and we got a series of cases that we looked at in which the presumption was in fact rebutted. As far as commercial and business agreements are concerned, the presumption is that there is an intention to create legal relations, and our leading case here is Edwards and Skyways. Again, the presumption can be rebutted, and we looked at a number of cases in which, in fact, the presumption was rebutted. Thank you very much for your attention.